I think one of the things that America has to face is the reality that it is an empire. No, you must use it. You must use it because it make you rebel against what? They were in front of Radio 8, shooting at the station. No es un crimen defender nuestros propios derechos como pueblos indígenas. Greetings and blessings. You're listening to the Travelog Media Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Claral, podcasting from Quetzaltenango, Guatemala. Thanks for joining me. On this show, I'm very excited to have my next guest with me in the studio. She's been traveling in Guatemala and in, in Shela for about a week. And we'll be talking about the work she's doing here. Uh, she's super talented, super passionate. She's the director of Alma Dance, Birth Doula at Our Birth Doula, and managing director of the New York Dance and Performance Awards, the Bessies. Heather Robles, thanks for being on the Travelog Media Podcast. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. All right. So um, why don't uh, why don't you start with uh, just giving listeners a little bit of uh, an idea of your background, your background in dance and choreography and maybe, you know, all my dance, how that, how that came together. Sure. I have been dancing just about my whole life. And, um, when my parents saw me dancing in the living room when I was two, they decided that I should maybe take a dance class and they put me into ballet and I promptly told them, informed them that dance was my life. And I haven't stopped since. I am now 33 years old. And, um, and I love dance so much. And I kind of believe everything is dance. Um, I love movement. It's what connects us. It is all life. Um, and, uh, so I've trained in, in many forms, um, uh, up until I was, uh, 17, I was mainly studying classical ballet. Um, and then I moved to New York to study with the Alvin Ailey, uh, dance company at their school, the Ailey school. And then I, uh, went to college at Marymount Manhattan college and, got my BFA in, uh, modern dance and choreography. I have performed with many companies, um, around the world. And I have just started my own dance company this year called Alma Dance. And, uh, we had our first show earlier this year. It was an apartment art show in my apartment in Brooklyn, uh -huh. which was fantastic. And, uh, we are working on putting together a split bill this December with Suzanne Panamarenko Dance and later next year touring in Mexico City. All right. And so what, what, was, the, what was the decision? How did, how, what, when did you think you wanted to start your own company? When did you go from just being dance, interested in dance to like, I'm right, I'm going to do, I'm going to start this own, my own company? I actually co-founded a company right out of college called Illuminations Dance Company uh, with a partner, and uh, we continued together for about a year, a year and a half before disbanding, and I continued to make work after that, and 10 years later, I realized I really need a home for my work, and I had resisted creating another company, um, but I realized... This is actually something one of my former students said. It's scary either way. So I might as well do what I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so I decided to just go for it. And, um, and I'm, I am all in. So it's still scary because it's not easy, um, but nothing is. And especially the things that are worth it are not easy. Um, but it also is super rewarding. Right. You just remind. I just reminded. Uh, was reminded of the that T-shirt. So that uh, don't forget uh, approval. Go for respect or something like that. Right. <laughs> Gloria Steinem. Yeah. 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 Um, 
now so, uh, let's see so we you um you were in Guatemala in uh, two years ago yes in 2017 I was here with uh, Suzanne Ponomarenko Dance at that time, and I am with Suzanne Ponomarenko Dance now as well. Okay. And, yeah, and how big is your group? Uh, you're traveling with some other... This uh, this time we are a group of six, uh, actually a group of seven. Yeah. Yeah, one of our members arrived last night. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we've been six, and now we are seven. Okay. <laughs> And so these are the, um, dancers with uh, Susan Panamarenko dance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we all have different backgrounds. Um, we all have different styles. Um, we're all different ages. And because of that, we all have many different things we can offer to um, the girls and the children that we are working with. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so... We'll, we'll get into we'll get we'll get get in, into more of the um, the the organizations you're working with, um, um, but I want I want to uh, get a sense more of a sense of where tr how travel figures in your work like what how how does to to what extent is travel part of your work how how important is it? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is travelogue media, so I, you know. Right, <laughs> right. Um, it's something that is very important to me, and I haven't been completely certain why. And now that I'm traveling again with Suzanne Panamarenko Dance, it's just it just becomes more and more clear to articulate, and that's to connect with people around the world. Um, dance is universal, and the issues we face as human beings are also universal. We very often in the United States tend to be in a silo, especially where I live in New York. It's a, it's a it's own universe and you can be as closed in into your universe as you want actually. Um, so to step outside of that and to connect with people around the world, um, it expands my sense of the world, of my community, and community is very, very important to me. It's very important to all of uh, the people that I work with. It's very important to the company that I'm dancing with right now, Suzanne Panamarenko Dance, and um, and it's important to me in all of the work that I do in all of my in all of my work, in all of my jobs, and including as a choreographer. Mm -hmm. Um. Can you talk about the um, uh, yeah? I mean, Guatemala is well. There's a lot, I don't know. There's a lot we could say about Guatemala. Um, what, what was the difference between your first trip and this trip? Do you feel? Do you, do you still? Did you still get the sense? Like, does it seem familiar this this trip, or does it still feel like you're exploring? Um, I'm Travel. always exploring, even in New York, I'm exploring, even in my apartment, I'm exploring, <laughs> <laughs> Good um, but that's how I kind of go about living life. Yeah. Um, and, uh, when I was here two years ago, that was the second time I've been in Guatemala. The first time was about seven years ago when my brother lived in Central America and we, um, went through Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala. And I still feel even two years ago when I came back to visit, there were places I went where I just felt at home and I experienced that again here. And it's funny how the body remembers spaces. I have gone on walks where the surroundings are very different, but I know it's familiar. And then I realize oh, this is where I got a tattoo or like, oh, this uh -huh. is where um, I did my laundry or, oh, this is where my friend lived. And uh, so it's really interesting how it's interesting how things uh, settle into your being and become part of you. And that doesn't leave even when you leave and then return many years later. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk about some of those, like maybe some of those places, like I guess you're no stranger to Central America. You've 
traveled there before and so were there some other what were some of the places that that you mentioned about you that that you connected with um the lake atitlan atitlan el lago um i read this amazing book called secrets of the talking jaguar a few years ago maybe in 2015 and um, when he, the, the author is talking about his experiences being at the lake. Um, I just had this incredible hunger to go and I visited two years ago and I went back last week to the lake and it's a place where I can listen to the earth and no doubt, I don't know very much about the history of the people, even though I do know some history, there's so much to learn and so much of it that doesn't exist in a way I can learn anymore. Um, which is sad, you know, there, there, there are histories that are erased that we will never know, but I being there, I'm thinking about them. I'm thinking about the people who have existed there always. I'm thinking about how the lake was formed with the volcanoes and it is a sacred space. Um, it, it was a sacred space. It still is a sacred space to the people who live there, but also the earth is sacred. Um, and, and, and being there it for, for me, it's a very, it's a very easy place to be uh, able to connect and listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to, um, I want, I want you to talk a little bit more about specifically about the organizations you're working with, but, and you're, and you're, you know, you're, you're wanting to make these connections through dance, through art. Um, I mean, many people in Guatemala are still, dealing with their history in, in some ways, in many ways. And, um, so yeah, how is, how is dance important to that process of, you know, recovering like a country that has a, a, a vibrant arts scene. And then all of a sudden there's this, you know, all this kind of violence. And so it takes, you know, it's a lot of processing for all these kind of things to happen. So talk about maybe the, you know, how, how dance is in, important in that process. Small question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, um, well, violence is, begins in thought and then manifests outside of that it has to go through the body and then into action. Um, all of us as human beings deal with trauma and violence. Um, and po certain populations much more than others. Dance works with the body. It works with the soul, with the mind, with everything that encompasses our being it deals with our histories. Um, the body is a kind of, I think of it kind of like a, there's storage in there. You know, there are things that come out when you move that you didn't realize were still in there. Like sometimes I feel a pinch in my shoulder and I know, I know now it's taking me a few years to discover this. I know now when I feel that pinch, it's cause I feel threatened, uh, I, I feel threatened by male violence. It's very specific. Um, and um, dance is a way to kind of discover that. That's how I discovered that actually was in a rehearsal. <laughs> and dance, um, because dance is working with the body and working with the entire being, it's a conversation you have with yourself. It's a conversation you have with others and it's a conversation you have with the whole space around you. It's really infinite. There's, it knows no bounds. And so what's possible I believe is also infinite. And the way I think about dance is not 
it can be anything and there's no wrong way for dance to be. And, um, and I love to see dance performances, but I also love dance as a way of discovering everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so when, uh, you know, on this trip, Suzanne Ponomarenko dance, uh, we are working with two organizations. One is called Ogar Temporal, and that is a women's shelter for survivors of um, rape and domestic violence. It um, currently we are working with uh, about about seventy girls and about thirty babies. Um, and it is dance is a way to reclaim the space of your body when that space has been taken from you. Um, it is a way for you to heal. It's a way for you to acknowledge your power to kind of get back into your body when you've had to disassociate from it to survive. So we connect with our breath a lot. Um, we connect with our voice. We sing. We bring rhythm into our bodies. And we move together. We also really support and acknowledge each other the entire time. We clap. We say, that was great. You know, we really... We acknowledge and witness each other's beauty and strength, which is also something I would like to see happen more in the world with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Acknowledge that in ourselves and um, acknowledge that in others. We don't have to be so stingy with our honoring of other human beings and definitely of ourselves. So I think when I'm teaching that's very much what I'm doing, um, what we are doing together. Um, in the second organization we are working with, which is Caras Alegres, we are working with about 55 uh, children who are just the cutest things. <laughs> They're so amazing and so sassy. <laughs> they have so much energy. It's amazing. Um, and this is an after-school program. It's a, it's a fantastic place. Both organizations are fantastic. And we are working with, I'm working with the older kids in this group. And we're working on a dance from India and a hip-hop dance. And we're combining moves of bachata and uh, some canciones de español which the kids have been requesting. So it's a conglomerate of movement from around the world and very much at their request. And that is also a conversation that is happening when you combine movements from all around the world. That's a conversation with the world and with bodies around the world and histories and stories around the world. <laughs> Maybe can um, I just expand on on some of the interactions in these in these groups you're working with, and some of them maybe some of the responses. What uh, and you know how did this? Well, how you know maybe you can talk about the how how do you how did this relationship form? I mean, you were here two years ago with um, Cara, Caras Alegres, see, sí. and Ogar Temporal, uh, Temporal, también, sí. Okay. And then how did you approach these organizations and talk about maybe some of the early interactions, the responses? Sure. Actually, I didn't have anything to do with that. Suzanne did. Suzanne set up the entire thing. And she's the one who had this idea, which I love. <laughs> and um, she um, worked two years ago and again now with a broader view um, and you know, they, a broader view works in Guatemala and they, this is, you know, they have set everything up already. They already have, you know, they're grounded here. 
So it's not like we are coming in uh, and saying, hey, can we work with you to these organizations? These organizations have volunteers who come to them uh, semi-regularly. There are not many volunteers who visit Hogar Temporal. Uh, we have just found out. And so uh, Suzanne developed a curriculum with a broader view and us, uh, but she really, she is the person who had this idea to begin with. And she is the one who has spearheaded the entire thing both times and has done an incredible job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're going to take a short break and be right back with Heather Robles. If you're enjoying this podcast, you can show your support by listening on the Radio Public app on your Android or Apple device. Look for the link in the show notes for details on how to download the free Radio Public app. Or if you prefer to make a direct donation, you can visit paypal.me slash jskmedia. Your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts are always appreciated, but even better, it's telling a friend about Travelog Media. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. All right. Thanks for listening to the Travelog Media Podcast. We're here with Heather Robles. Uh, now, Heather, you're also a doula. Yes, I am a birth doula. Okay. And uh, there are other doulas, other types of doulas as well. There are, there are abortion doulas. There are um, end-of-life doulas. And I'm... There are, I'm sure, more types of doulas, um, but I specifically am a birth doula. Mm -hmm. And how did that come about? When did you when did you get involved with that? Uh, my best friend was having a baby, and she asked me to be um, the godmother of her first child. And so I asked her, you know, how are you going to have the baby? And she said, I'm just going to go to the hospital and and have him. And I said, okay, great. How, what else are you going to do? And she's like, that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and I said, okay, great, cool. So I just decided to read some books and, and see how I could support her. Um, cause I didn't feel like I knew that much about the whole process and I wanted to know what she would be going through so I could support her. And as I was reading books about childbirth, I became incredibly inspired. I felt like I discovered I'm a unicorn uh -huh. <laughs> as a woman. Uh -huh. um, I can, you know, I can grow life out of my body. And uh, the stories that I was reading were so incredible. Um, I actually bought this book called, I'm going to, I don't want to mess it up. It's a uh, joyful, spontaneous, natural birth. And I bought this book when I was at the Wasaic Project years ago, uh, which is a, a dance festival and music festival and film festival. It's an art festival. It's incredible. And it's upstate in New York. And um, one of the women running a food truck uh, had this book and for sale. And I, I asked her about it. And she said, yes, this is my book. And... Um, when I gave, I've had two babies, one in the hospital and one naturally. And after I had my natural birth, I wanted to make this book about, you know, stories of women who had had uh, babies naturally. And so that's the book I was reading. And I just became incredibly inspired about what I was reading about what is possible with birth and the, the powerful process it is. And so, uh, then a friend of mine, you know, told me that her daughter was also pregnant and, uh, had a birth doula. And I said, what's that? And, um, she said, you know, it's someone who kind of coaches you and helps you through the process. And I thought it was the most bougie thing I had ever heard of. <laughs> I thought who needs one of those That's ridiculous, <laughs> um, but then she said, and then I said, well, you know, birth is really cool. Here's why, what I think about it. And she, she's listening to me and I am really, uh, gushing about how cool I think birth is. And she goes, you should be a doula. <laughs> and I was like, huh? And you're right. Maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, you know, in the stories I was reading, many of them, um, uh, many of the, uh, 
mothers had doulas and, um, I just, you know, I, the more I read about doulas as well, um, and the statistics of how they can help women, first of all, live, um, and go through more harmonious processes, uh, no matter what kind of birth they're having. Um, I just decided, you know, I want to do this and I, it's totally different from dance, but I can feel it. I want this. And, um, and I decided that and then attended my first birth and everything in my life felt like it was preparing me for that moment to be with this couple and this amazing journey that they had in their birth. It was just the most incredible experience. And then I got trained and now I have a business. Uh -huh. <laughs> what was the, tr I'm, what was the training? How long was the training process? How long did um, I trained with an incredible midwife who was also a doula who trained with, um, Ina May Gaskin and, uh, her name is Michelle L'Esperance and she lives in Massachusetts. And so I trained there. It was two intensive weekends and, uh, three required, uh, intensive books, uh, to read, um, a f several birth education classes, and then also attending several births. So, um, I have attended six births and the entire process of certification completion is for me about two years. Okay. Okay. And are these, th are these take happen in homes or in hospitals or where, where like they can happen anywhere, anywhere. Yep. Yeah, you don't even know sometimes. <laughs> so you just show up at the hospital. Well, like, um, <laughs> all of the births that I have attended were scheduled to be in the hospital. Um, however, one birth, uh, happened spontaneously at home and I caught the baby simply cause I was there and Just in the right place. Yeah. The, right <laughs> the bat baby was coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we, when we realized that, um, uh, we called nine one one cause I said, it's, we got to go to the hospital now. <laughs> and, um, when it was clear we weren't going to make it there, uh, we called nine one one, but the baby came before nine one one arrived and, um, she was perfect, landed right in my hands, most amazing, magical, uh, baby and mother and grandmother and family. And, uh, I am forever connected to them. Uh, okay. And, uh, so my, my, these women you're working with, are they, do they, most of them rather have births at home or do they have like, several or? of them wanted births at home. Mm -hmm. Um, but all of them were planned to be in the hospital and I will work with any, any individual who wants to birth in any way that they wish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And the name again, of the, the, is it, so it's your, your company. Yes. It's called our birth doula. Okay. And there will be a a social media thing or a, yes, we, but, will, we do have an Instagram. I do have an Instagram called our birth doula and yep. You can find me on Instagram and soon on Facebook and soon on a website. <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll look for those. Yeah. We'll look for those. Okay. Um, I guess I, I want to circle back, I guess a little bit to traveling and in, in Guatemala and the, what, what, what experiences, what kinds of things would you like to bring back to people where you live in, in New York and what, and carry it, carry this, this experience forward? How would you like to see that happen? I don't completely know yet. Mm. Every day is a new day. <laughs> Every day I have, I learned so much and, uh, well, what I'm discovering right now or what I'm feeling right now is, um, just how connected we all are and what we, I mean, I live in the United States. I live in New York city and, uh, the United States has a president right now that is racist and 
horrible and is shutting out people and removing them as well. People who have been there. Um, and the people of Guatemala, certainly if they want to, when they want to go visit is very, very difficult. It's very challenging. Um, and that's what I'm thinking about a lot while I am here, while I'm holding these beautiful babies in my arms. Um, I'm thinking a lot about the detention centers, which are like prisons in the United States where they are, where ice is taking families in the night and separating them and babies have trials and then are deported to where and, or they're put in, you know, emergency foster homes. Um, and I see how easily all of that can lead to abuse, further violence, human trafficking, and how, how awful it all is, how incredibly racist it is, how, um, it is, uh, I, I really can't believe it's happening, but it's absolutely happening. And, um, we, I think in, in the United States need to really lean in to see all of what is happening and do something about it. Right. It's unacceptable. It's horrific. I have friends who are being deported and um, I don't know if I'll ever see them again. Okay, Jason here with a post-interview update for you. Whenever you hear this little sound effect, that means I'm recording this after the interview with some additional information. So it turns out in a follow-up uh, that uh, her friend is not going to be deported after all. She received some good news uh, that uh, after her court date, a judge had told her friend she would be able to stay through 2023 uh, and that she could uh, apply for citizenship during that time. So good news. Um, and let's continue with the interview. What are some things you're doing to maintain <laughs> uh, sanity, maintain mental health and emotional? And I mean, because you, you're exactly right. I mean, we're, we're facing this horrible brutality and uh, yeah. So, what do you? How do you? How do you keep yourself healthy? <laughs> Um, I meditate for 30 minutes every day and sometimes longer if I need to, I'll return to sitting when I, when I need to, um, I breathe. It's so, it's so essential. It sounds so simple, but really I can feel when my body doesn't feel like a body anymore and I connect with my breath and put my hand on my heart and on my stomach and Remember that I am part of nature and that we all are, no matter how horrible someone might be acting, um, we are all from nature and I can't hate nature. It's not possible. <laughs> um, I can loathe actions, but actions can change. Um, so being in action to change things is part of what keeps me sane. Um, having conversations like this, um, connecting with family every day and friends. Um, and you know, I was actually just talking to my mom about this last night. You know, sometimes it feels like throwing pebbles at waves, but you know, she reminded me that 
when we arrived a few days ago at Caras Alegres, some of the, the children who were there or who are there now were there two years ago. And they came up to us and they're like, Hey, I remember you. And they started doing the dance that we taught them two uh-huh. years ago. Oh, wow. So there, there is an impact and I have no idea how far that can ripple out to. Um, but as my mom reminded me, I need to honor that. Um, I also, and if, if I'm not honoring that, um, I can't honor anyone else. I can't honor anyone else's actions either. Um, I have to, I have to acknowledge the good that we are doing. I have to acknowledge good period. That's also how I stay sane is acknowledging good. And actually I can always tell when I'm not, (laughs) when I'm feeling overwhelmed by the things I do not approve of or that are overwhelming, um, to acknowledge and recognize the good everywhere. There always is good always. So it can always be found. So what's coming up next? Well, we have the rest of our week here as a company. Tomorrow we have um, combined performances at Caras Alegres, uh, the dances that we have taught the students there, um, part of which they have made up as well. So, you know, like all of my students have contributed to the dance by putting in moves and we call it, you know, the Fernanda or the Ebi or the Udi. And, uh, so, you know, even that's a conversation together that we've made and we are going to share that with their parents tomorrow. And, um, we have probably about five dances the students will be doing and some songs. And, uh, as a company, we will be showing some pieces that we have made as well. Suzanne has a piece she created. I have a piece I created. Um, and it's going to be great. So that's, that's more of what we will be doing and, um, continuing to learn together this week and then figuring out how to carry this forward always, 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 and staying connected, um, when we leave. All right. Um, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> How do you stay sane? Way. I don't know. At least that's the question I'm asking myself at this very moment. <laughs> yeah, it does feel very, very overwhelming. And it just feels, I, yeah, we're going through dark times in a lot of ways. But yeah, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned um, acknowledging positive things because they are there and they're just as real yeah but yeah it can be can be difficult to remember that for sure so absolutely yeah so if if if, um if the only thing i can do is to do a podcast then i'll do a podcast and um can you mention again uh one more time the uh your well, you don't maybe have existing social media, but you have, you just want to mention your, your groups. Sure. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alma dance, we'll have a website soon and we will be on Facebook and Instagram. Our birth doula is already on Instagram and we will soon have a website and Facebook. The Bessie awards where I'm the managing director we have an Instagram at Bessie Awards, and we have a website, www.bessies.org. All right. Heather Robles, thank you so, so much for taking some time in your schedule and coming into the studio with Travelog Media. Gracias so very por much todo. very appreciated, and <laughs> all the best of luck to you in your, and success in your, in your work. Thank you. Thank you. 
That's going to do it for this episode of the Travelog Media Podcast. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Check the hashtag Travelog Media. It's Travel O G U E Media. You can support this podcast by listening on the Radio Public app or by making a direct donation to paypal.me/slash JSK Media. Look for links in the show notes. Music is remixed from Robero's Wanderlide. Que toda sea amor, walk tall, live free. <laughs>